going to be Matthew chapter 9, and we're going to talk about the great physician, Dr. Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ. It says in Matthew 9, 12, that when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that behold need not a physician, but they that are sick. Jesus Christ is commonly referred to as the great physician. I've always been amazed by doctors and how they know the things that they know and how they're able to do the things that they do. In Colossians 4.14, it calls Luke the beloved physician. Jesus Christ is the physician that the beloved physician looks up to. And here's some reasons why. Because he cures your sin. Now look at Matthew 9.1. And he entered into a ship and passed over and came into his own city. So the doctor was coming to town and noticed what the people began to do. In Matthew 9, 2, And behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy, lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. So Jesus, seeing their faith, he sees their faith, you know, the ones that brought the man to him. And look at Mark 2, 4, and notice how they brought the man to the, to the Lord. It says in Mark 2, 4, And when they could not come nigh to him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was, and when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. So they have so much faith that, you know, there's all these people around, they couldn't come close to him because of the press, and they get on top of the roof, uncover the roof where he was, and let down the man right down there in the midst of Jesus. So that he could be healed. And so Jesus seeing their faith. You know that looks like great faith to him. And he, he heals him. So it's not just about the faith of the person that's sick. It could also be about the faith of the people. That are bringing the person to Jesus. But notice something else. Notice Jesus calls him son. He said son be of good cheer. Thy sins be forgiven thee. This proves his deity because this guy's most likely older than the Lord. Why would he call an older man son? Uh, Jesus Christ was more concerned also with his spiritual sickness than he was his physical problems. You know, he was sick of the palsy, but the Lord was more concerned about what he had going on spiritually. He has the cure for your sin sickness. He cures your sin. And trust me, you do have a sin sickness. Ephesians 2 1 shows that a man who isn't saved is dead in trespasses and sins. Romans 3 23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 5 6 reveals that a lost man is without strength. Just like this man who's sick of the palsy. This man who was sick of the palsy had some men who brought him to Jesus Christ. Because he didn't have any strength to get to him himself. When your Bible is open, it lays out flat like a stretcher. You need to open it and bring someone to Jesus Christ, just like these people did. Open your Bible and bring them to Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ can cure their sin sickness. That's why they call him the great physician, because he cures your sin. The next thing is he clears your mind. In Matthew 9, 3, it says, And behold, certain of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemeth. When the scribes saw Jesus claiming to forgive this man's sins, they said something within themselves, and Jesus could hear it. In Psalm 94, 11, it says, The Lord knoweth the thoughts of man, that they are vanity. In Psalm 139.1, it says, O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. In Psalm 139.2, thou knowest my down sitting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. 1 John 3.20 For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart, and knoweth 
all things. You see, they thought this stuff within themselves. They were thinking these bad things about the Lord within themselves. And they were accusing him of blasphemy, but they're the ones blasphemy. And the Lord sees their thoughts, but the thing is, he's the great physician, and he can clear their mind. You see, a lot of people go to a psychiatrist to get their mind right. But Jesus knows your brain a lot better than you do, and he can clear your mind. It says in Romans 12, 2, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. It says in 2 Timothy 1, 7, For God, God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. You see, if the scribes would allow Jesus to work on them, then he would have. You see, they said within themselves, this man blasphemeth. You see, they uh, those guys, they brought that man sick of the palsy and put him right there in the midst of Jesus. Jesus first was worried about his spiritual problem, and he said, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. They didn't like that because they knew only God can forgive sins. So they said, This man blasphemeth. They said it within themselves. Jesus heard the whole thing. And if they'd let him, he would clear their mind and cure their sin. And this just, but this shows their, they had dirty hearts. And the thing is, the Lord Jesus Christ, the, the great physician, can also cleanse your heart. He cleanses hearts. Much better than a cardiologist. That's a heart doctor. In Matthew 9, 4, it says, And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? Man has an evil heart. It says in Psalm 10, 3, For the wicked boasteth of his heart's desire, and blesseth the covetous, whom the Lord abhorreth. The wicked boasteth of his heart's desire. In Proverbs 6, uh, 16 through 18, one of the things the Lord hates is an heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. In Jeremiah 17, 9, it says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? The Lord is much better than your heart doctor. He can see your heart. And the thing is, he can become your heart donor. You need one because the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And you don't even have to be prescribed any painkillers afterwards because he can give you a merry heart. In Proverbs 17, 22, it says, A merry heart doeth good like a medicine. In Psalm 51, 10, it says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. You see, these scribes are skeptics. They don't believe the reviews about the ultimate doctor. They think he's committing blasphemy by saying, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But they have proven that they need both a brain and a heart transplant. So the Lord tries to, he tries to make some, talk some sense into them. And he says in verse 5, For whether is easier to say thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say arise and walk. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. Then saith he to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and go into thine house. So he has power on earth to forgive sins and heal the sick. He can cure your sin, clear your mind, cleanse your heart. And look what the man does. He arose and departed to his house. And the great physician did these miracles but to confirm the word. He wanted to confirm the word with signs following. In Matthew 9, 8, it says, But when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God, which had given such power unto men. So they saw him heal the man that was sick of the palsy. And he was healing people and doing things that a normal man could not do. And this is because he was confirming the word that it was preached. Notice that power unto men. This is what they said which had given such power unto men. You see, they didn't realize he was more than just a man yet. They didn't realize he was the Son of God yet. There was a lot of skeptics, a lot of doubters. But the multitude saw it and marveled. They marveled. Jesus went around preaching and confirming the word with signs following. He needed these people to 
be in awe, be astonished, be be marveled at what he was doing. Because that's the only way he could really confirm the word to them. You see, because the Jews require a sign, as it says in 1 Corinthians one twenty two, And that's why you see so much about signs. When you get an operation done, you want a doctor that's been able to back up what he's saying. You know, if he's had a lot of patients, then you can see the evidence that he can not only talk like a doctor, but he can perform like one. Jesus could back up everything that he said. You know, he went around preaching the go the gospel of the kingdom of heaven, and it wasn't just words. He could actually show you evidence that he was who he said he was. So that's why he went around confirming the word. Just like any good doctor will not only talk like a doctor, he'll perform like one. The next thing is he counsels every class. You see, a good doctor will see any patient that comes through. The rich, the poor, the short, the fat, the ugly, the skinny, whatever you might be. Jesus came to save sinners, and that is all kinds of sinners. Whether it be a tax collector like this man here in Matthew 9.9, 9, and as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom, and he saith unto him, Follow me, and he arose and followed him. Notice that Matthew didn't give an excuse here. He didn't go ask. He didn't ask to do something else first. He got up and went. You see, he was a publican. People hated him. He sat at the receipt of custom. He, he was pretty much a thief. You see, the Roman government had them in charge of taxing the people, and they had so much they had to tax, and then they could tax even more than they were required to and then pocket the rest for themselves. They were kind of considered thieves, and Matthew is the publican. He's one of those thieves. He's the Levi. Matthew's the, the Levi of Mark 2.14 and Luke 5.27. Matthew is who wrote the Gospel of Matthew. But here he just drops his career to follow Jesus Christ, and he invites him over to his house. He's going to invite the great physician over to his house. And you're going to see that the Lord comes in there. He's no respecter of persons. He counsels every class of people that comes into his life, even a publican like Matthew. But it, it gives some extra details in Luke chapter 5, verse 28. Talking about Matthew, it says, And he left all, rose up, and followed him. And Levi, which is Matthew, made him a great feast in his own house. So he invited Jesus over for dinner. And there was a great company of publicans and of others that sit down with him. All kinds of different people. See, he counsels every class. In Matthew 9, 10, it says, And it came to pass, as Jesus said at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. So notice the Lord, no respecter of persons. The publicans were tax collectors that everybody hated. And where it says sinners, you know, he eats with publicans and sinners. These were the ones the people considered to be extremely wicked. You see, that's the way the word's used here. You see, they didn't use the word in the sense that Paul used it, for you, where, you know, you know, he's referring, Paul refers to himself as a sinner. He refers to all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. No, when these people said sinner, they were talking about extremely wicked people here. When Paul used it, he used it to refer to everybody. In Matthew 9, 11, it says, but when the, And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? You see, don't you hate when someone asks a question about you even though you're sitting right there? You know, they're sitting there asking a question about Jesus and, you know, he's sitting right there in front of them. They were accusing Jesus of not being separated and doing it right in his face. But, you see, he counsels every class. He doesn't, you know, neglect anybody. It says in verse 12, but when Jesus heard that, you see, he's, he hears everything they're saying. He's sitting right there. He said to them, They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. You see, here Jesus Christ refers to himself as a physician. And he sits with these publicans and sinners because that that's who the one he, he that's who he comes to save is sinners. The Pharisees just have too much pride to admit that that's what they are themselves. They are the ones who the Lord gets angry and sarcastic with. And that's what he does in verse 13. He says, but go ye and learn what that meaneth. Isn't that funny? To the 
most highly educated and egotistical people of his day, he says, but go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And here he's quoting Hosea 6.6, 6, For I desired mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. But imagine how mad these self-righteous know-it-alls would have gotten when Jesus Christ looked at them and says, But go ye and learn what that meaneth. He's like, you guys have a lot to learn. See, Jesus counseled every class, the publicans, the sinners, and even here, the Pharisees. It says in 1 Timothy 1.15, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came in the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. There's no, there's no sinner that he cannot save. There's no sinner that he cannot help. But the next thing about this great physician is that he is a comforting presence. He counsels every class, and he's a comforting presence. If you've ever been badly hurt or in the hospital, then you know when the doctor comes in the room, it can be a comforting presence because the person who can fix your problem just walked in the door. You know, you've been seeing nurses and everybody and their grandma all this time, but now the doctor comes in the door, and now things are going to start to change. He can fix you. No doubt about it, the Lord Jesus Christ was a comforting presence to the disciples. And it says, Then came to him the disciples of John, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast oft, you know, like often, but thy disciples fast not? You see, fasting is a good thing, but sometimes you can be overzealous in a good thing to the point that you think everyone needs to be doing it as much as you're doing it. In this case, for the disciples of John, it was fasting. They thought everyone had to fast like they fast. You have to watch out getting so into something, even a good thing, that you begin to judge everyone's spirituality off of that one thing. That's what they were doing, the disciples of John. They may fast, and the Lord's disciples didn't fast, but the disciples were probably better in other areas. You know, you may have this great thing that you do all the time. You may think that you're more spiritual than everybody else, but everybody else may be doing something else that you're not doing. You have to watch judging people off of one thing like this. You know, you may read the Bible 12 times a year and judge everyone's spirituality on how many times they read the Bible. But just because you read the Bible 12 times a year doesn't mean you're doing everything that everybody else is doing. You know, you can't just judge somebody off of one thing like these guys are doing. But notice what the Lord says. He says in Matthew 9, 15, Can the children of the broad chamber mourn? As long as the bridegroom is with them, but the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them, and then shall they fast. So the children of the bride chamber, they didn't need to mourn because the bridegroom, the Lord, was presently with them, and he was a comforting presence. He was, he was there. There wasn't a need for them to fast. He was a comforting presence to them. He was supplying them with everything that they needed. But the day is coming when the bridegroom, the Lord Jesus, is taken away, the tribulation, and then shall they fast. And notice how Luke writes this in Luke 5.35, But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them. You know, the day's coming when the Lord Jesus is taken away, and then shall they fast in those days. Their comforting presence is not there like it used to be. The phrase, in those days, is commonly referring to the tribulation time period throughout your Bible. Look up the phrase, in those days. Many times you'll see it associated with the time of the tribulation. It says, so who are the children, you know, who are these children of the bride chamber that it talks about? Well, the, we know the bridegroom is Jesus Christ, and the bride is obviously the church, but this chapter's got nothing to do with the church. It's And it's talking... In, in the sense that the church isn't even going to take place. And Jesus isn't referring to the church anywhere in the chapter. So the children of the bride chamber are not the church. They are people like the friends of the bridegroom and guests that will be at the wedding. You see, Jesus Christ is the bridegroom. Me and you and every saved people today and all throughout the church age make up the bride. And one day the bride's going to marry Jesus Christ. But there will also be guests at the wedding. 
You know, John the Baptist said in John 3.29, He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. You see, he talks about the friend of the bridegroom. Not the bride, but the friend. You see, John is a friend of the bridegroom, but he's not the bride. You see, in Luke 16.16, 16, it says, The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached, and every man presseth into it. So the law and the prophets were until John. So the friends of the bridegroom that will be at this future wedding between Jesus Christ and his bride, the friends of the bridegroom are the saints from Moses, from Moses, you see, the law, to John the Baptist. The law and the prophets were until John. Those are your friends that will be at the wedding. You see, the saints under the law all the way to John, they're not in the body. They're the ones that are considered friends of the bridegroom. They're not, they don't make up the bride of Christ. You see, there are saints that aren't part of the bride of Christ. They are friends of the bridegroom. Me and you, saved people from the church age, make up the bride. But then you have another group, the friends of the bridegroom, from Moses to John the Baptist, and you have another group, well, you know the story of the ten virgins. The five wise ones represent tribulation Jews who will also be at the wedding. Look at Matthew 25, 1. This is about the ten virgins. It says, Shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom? So they're not getting married. They're simply going to meet the bridegroom. And it says, And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps, and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go you out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with them to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Also notice, these are virgins that's key the bible's exact with stuff these are virgins not one chaste virgin that's what the bride is me and you make up one chaste virgin the tribulation jews that believe are not the same as church age believers you see me and you make up the bride these five virgins here are coming to the wedding, but they're not the bride. You, and then you also have another group. See, you had the group that were, was Moses to John the Baptist. Those are your friends. And then you got these ten virgins here. Uh, they're simply going to meet the bridegroom. Five of them are ready that go into the wedding. Well, at least in this story here. The five are wise and five are foolish. But also notice, you got tribulation Gentiles that are saints during that time. And it says in Matthew 22, 9 and 10, Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid them to, once again, the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. So now here's your guests at the wedding. And what's going on here is this is uh, prophetically the 144,000 from the book of Revelation going out and getting Gentile converts. So there's another group, guests at the wedding. You got the friends, you got the guests at the wedding tri that are tribulation Gentiles. You got the tribulation Jews that believe that are the that show up at the wedding and then 
you have another group, and these will be the concubines. They are the saints before the law, before Moses. They go from Adam to Moses. And the Song of Solomon illustrates these, these people groups. In Song of Solomon 6, 8 through 9 and 10, it says that there are three score queens and four score concubines and virgins without number. He says, my dove, my undefiled is but one. There's the bride. She is the only one of her mother. She is the choice one of her that bare her. The daughters saw her and blessed her, yea, the queens and the concubines, and they praised her. Who is she that looketh forth as the morning, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, and terrible as an army with manners? So you see, you got queens, you got concubines, you got virgins, and you got the one. The one chaste virgin. So you got another group. <clears throat> You've got the millennial saints. You can call them the queens, and they are illustrated by the queen of Sheba in 1 Kings 10. But she goes to see King Solomon in all his glory. She wanted to see everything he had and see his wisdom for herself. And what this pictures is these, it pictures the Gentile nations coming into Jerusalem to see Jesus Christ. And that's another people group, the millennial saints. Those are the queens. You see, in the millennium, these Gentile nations will have to come to Jerusalem to worship the king. In Revelation 21, 24, and the nations of them which are saved shall look, shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth shall do bring their glory and honor into it. So those are your people groups. Not every saint in the Bible is part of the church, the body of Christ. They're not all part of that one chaste virgin. You know, some of them are referred to as virgins. You got the concubines, you got the queens, you got the you got the different people groups. You got to rightly divide. You see, Matthew 25 has nothing to do with the church. These are virgins. Those are the, your tribulation Jews. In Matthew 22, it refers to the tribulation Gentiles who are led to the Lord by the 144,000. They're the guests at the wedding. You know, it talks about the friends of the bridegroom. John the Baptist, for example. And these are, a lot of these are your children of the bride chamber. And Jesus Christ is a comforting presence. And while he was there, they didn't have to fast. They didn't have to mourn because he was a comforting presence to them. And the next thing is he conquered the law. You see, he went to law school and aced it. He's a doctor of the law. And Galatians 3.24, it says, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we may be justified by faith. Jesus Christ is the only one who didn't get slew by the commandments. He's the only one who kept the law perfectly. He went to law school and fulfilled it. He fulfilled the law. He schooled the law. If you looked at his report card, it would say, In all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Who did no sin, neither was God found in his mouth. That would be on his report card. When you have any kind of doctor or lawyer, you want them to have been the best in their class. Jesus was the best and only one in his class to pass the test. You see, we only pass the test because he gives us his perfect grade at salvation. He's our doctor and our lawyer, and when the devil accuses me, he objects to it. The Lord objects to it. It says in 1 John 2, 1, My little children, these things write I unto you, that you sin not, and if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. But it says in Matthew 9, 16, No man putteth a piece of new cloth into an old garment, for that which is put in to fill it up taketh from the garment, and the rent is made worse. You see, if you sew a piece of new cloth into an old garment, the new garment will shrink and then tear the old. So he says, Neither do men put new wine into old bottles, else the bottles break, and the wine runneth out, and the bottles perish. But they put new wine into new bottles, and both are preserved. You see, old bottles have already expanded to full capacity. So when you put new wine in old bottles, the new wine will expand and burst the bottles. And this represents the Old and New Testaments. When the New Testament comes, the old isn't going to work anymore. It says in Matthew 9, 18, While he spake these things unto them, behold, there came a certain ruler and worshipped him, saying, My daughter is even now dead, and came and come, but come and lay thy hand upon her, and she shall live. Before we get into that, he conquered the law. You see? He showed up 
while it was still under the Old Testament law, he's going to bring in the New Testament by his death on the cross. And it's going to be a much better testament. And you see, he, he uses the illustration of the new wine into old bottles. And the illustration of sewing a piece of a new cloth into a old garment. You see, these represent the Old New Testament. When the New Testament comes, the old's not going to work anymore. And the Lord brings in the New Testament. And he and look what it says here. And Jesus arose and followed him, and so did his disciples. So he's going to follow this guy. He's going to heal his daughter. But while the Lord is in the middle of helping this one patient, he also helps another. And this picture is how you can do good things on the way to do good things. Multitasking is key. This doctor is a multitasker. And with this great physician, call-ins aren't necessary. You don't have to call in. He's got a walk-in clinic. It says in Matthew 9, 20, And behold, a woman which, which was diseased with an issue of blood twelve years came behind him and touched the hem of his garment. For she said within herself, If I may but touch his garment, I shall be whole. She didn't have to call one of the disciples and make an appointment. She didn't have to schedule it two or three months out. She didn't have to sit in the waiting room with a mask on. She went right up to him and touched his garment. It's not like most doctors where you where you leave without anything being done. She left different. She had spent all her money on doctors for the past 12 years. This is because she hasn't been to the doctor of doctors. You see, in Mark 5, 25 through 26, it explains how a certain woman, which had an issue of blood 12 years and had suffered many things of many physicians, had spent all that she had and was nothing better, but rather grew worse. This woman only grew worse. Without Jesus, you're on a downhill slide. At the same time, it feels like you're going uphill. You will continue to get worse and worse. You see, if Jesus had been here in 2020, the planned pandemic would have been an epic failure because he cancels plagues. He cancels plagues. And that's what he did with this woman. Mark gives a little bit more detail and says she was healed from the plague. You see, people love to cancel things. But if Jesus was walking the earth back in 2020, he would have canceled every plague. It never would have even happened. In Mark 5, 27 through 29, when she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, if I may but touch it, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. The Lord didn't make her social distance. He let her get up close and personal. Nobody can stay sick around him. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? You see, all these people were touching him, but something was different about this woman's touch. When she touched him, virtue went out from him and to her. That is, strength went out from him to her. You see, God gave you strength when you were without strength. In Romans 5, 6, it says, For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. In Mark 5, 31, it says, And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou, Who touched me? Got all these people touching him, and he's like, Who touched me? And he looked round about to see her that had done this thing, but the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace, and be whole of thy plague. So he heals her. It says in Matthew 9, 22, But Jesus turned him about, and when he saw her, he said, Daughter, be of good comfort, thy faith hath made thee whole. And the woman was made whole from that hour. Your faith today also makes you whole. When you put your faith in the blood of Jesus Christ, you're going to be born into the family of God. You're going to leave different. Is that he's confident while operating. When you want a doctor, you want a doctor that's confident while he's operating. When you're about to have open heart surgery, you don't want a doctor with shaky hands. You don't want a doctor that's nervous. You want someone that could beat anybody in a game of operation. Jesus Christ was calm, cool, and confident when it came to healing people. He knew that there would be no misfires or mistakes. It didn't matter who was watching, what they were saying, or how they were laughing. It says in Matthew 9.23, it says, And when Jesus came into the ruler's house and he saw the minstrels, that's the people playing instruments, and the people making a noise, he said unto them, Give place, for the maid is not dead, but sleepeth. 
and they laughed him to scorn. He was so confident that he could heal her that he didn't even say she was dead. To him, she wasn't dead because he knew she was about to be awake. In Matthew nine twenty five and 26, But when the people were put forth, he went in and took her by the hand, and the maid arose. And the fame hereof went abroad into all that land. You notice Jesus didn't leave the house saying something like, Laugh now, suckers, or anything like that. He didn't rub it in their face. You know, they he came in there and they laughed at him. He raises somebody from the dead, and he doesn't even talk trash. He just confirmed the word with signs following. And around him, contacts became useless. When you go into the optometrist, he can give you glasses or contacts, but he can't give you guaranteed 20-20 vision in an instant. The Lord can take a completely blind man and fix his sight. Eyeglasses and contacts are useless around him. The contact makers would go out of business. In Matthew 9.27 it says, And when Jesus departed thence, two blind men followed him, crying and saying, Thou son of David, have mercy on us. You see, they knew the Messiah was coming from the line of David, and they knew it was Jesus. And when he was coming to the house, the blind men came to him. And Jesus saith unto them, Believe ye that I am able to do this? They said unto him, Yea, Lord. See, he's, he wants your faith. He asked them, Believe ye that I am able to do this? Then touched he their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it unto you. And their eyes were opened. And Jesus straightly charged them, saying, See that no man know it. But they, when they were departed, spread abroad his fame in all that country. So you can see how they just keep making him more and more famous. I mean, if you're going around healing people, making the blind be able to see again, and things like that, you're going to have a bunch of blind people coming to where you're at. And many times a family member goes crazy, and they take the family member to counselors or psychiatrists and other doctors to fix the problem. Sometimes they might even call in a Catholic priest to get the devil out of this person. But when Jesus Christ is around, you can cancel your exorcist. He didn't need holy water or crosses or to speak in Latin to get the devils out. In Matthew 9.32 it says, And as, as they went out, behold, they brought to him a dumb man possessed with the devil. Now a dumb man is not somebody that's stupid, it's a person who can't talk. A devil's caught his tongue. And when the devil was cast out, the dumb spake. And the multitudes marveled, saying, It was never so seen in Israel. So he got this devil out of this person, and then that person was able to speak. And the multitudes marveled. They're like, I've never even seen this guy speak before. But who needs an exorcist? You can cancel your exorcist when Jesus is around. Who needs a guy who's been to preschool? The Lord Jesus was schooling the doctors in the temple when he was just a young kid. A lot of people watch these conjuring movies and the exorcist movies, and they get scared to death. But the devils don't scare Jesus Christ. There's no problem that intimidates him. He could go into a house with this devil-possessed man, and I don't know how these people acted. I don't I doubt that their heads spun around and things like that. But even if they did, it would not scare Jesus in the slightest. It should it'd be just another day on the job for him. The Pharisees said he casteth out devils through the prince of the devils. The prince of the devils is obviously the devil himself. Notice he's called a prince in John twelve thirty one. It says, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Ephesians 2.2, 2, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. He's the prince of this world. He's the prince of the power of the air. And they're accusing Jesus of casting out devils through the prince of the devils. They think Jesus Christ is casting out devils by the power of the devil himself. Wow, they are some geniuses. How would that make sense? But a lot of doctors are in it for the money and for many other worldly reasons. 
but not the great physician. He's casting out devils to help people. That's his motive. It's got nothing to do with the devil. He actually became poor to do all these things. He's not in it for the money. He's not in it for the fame. He didn't sell his soul to the devil for this power. He actually left the comfort of heaven to come down and not even have a place to lay his head. The foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. So why does he do what he does? Compassion is the motive. It's not money. It's not fame. He's getting a lot of fame, that's for sure. But the motive is compassion. In Matthew 9.35, And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. He went around teaching and preaching. That was the main things. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 4.2, Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. The main thing wasn't the healing. The healing just confirmed the word. Mark 16.20 the Jews who require a sign, 1 Corinthians one twenty two. But here are some Bible sicknesses that the Lord's compassions moved him to heal. Matthew 8.2, leprosy. Matthew 8.6, palsy. Matthew 8.14, fever. Matthew 9.20, bleeding. Matthew 9.27, blindness. Matthew 12.10, a withered hand. Matthew 12.22, devil possession. Matthew 9.35, every sickness and every disease. You wouldn't be able to keep no disease around him. Jesus Christ had no problem curing or healing any so-called incurable disease. It says in Matthew 9.36, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them. Compassion is the motive. Because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Aren't we very fortunate that the God of heaven has compassion on us? Imagine if the God just happened to be an evil, evil God. He's not an evil God. He has compassion on people. Compare this with Ezekiel 34, 5. So he says, and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Compare this with Ezekiel 34, starting in verse 5, it says, And they were scattered because there is no shepherd. And they became meat to all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. My sheep wandered through all the mountains and upon every high hill. Yea, my flock was scattered upon all the face of the earth, and none did search or seek after them. Therefore, ye shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, saith the Lord God, surely because my flock became a prey, and my flock became meat to every beast of the field, because there was no shepherd, neither did my shepherds search for my flock. But the shepherds fed themselves, and fed not my flock. Therefore, O ye shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my flock at their hand, and cause them to cease from feeding the flock. Neither shall the shepherds feed themselves any more, for I will deliver my flock from their mouth, that they may not be meat for them. You see, he is disappointed in the shepherds. He's looking for a shepherd that's got compassion on the flock. That's more concerned with feeding the flock and not feeding themselves. Jesus Christ was more concerned with feeding the flock. He had com more compassion on the flock than he did himself. That's what he's looking for. Dr. Jesus isn't just like a medical doctor or an optometrist or card cardiologist or counselor or psychiatrist. He also is a doctor of theology. And he has compassion on the sheep. He said to Peter, he said to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. In 1 Peter 5, 2 through 4, it says, Feed the flock of God, which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd that's Jesus shall appear. Ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. You see, when the Lord ascended, he gave gifts unto men. The Lord, being a doctor of theology, knows how to teach faithful men to feed 
the flock. He doesn't want the sheep going around like sheep that have no shepherd. So in Ephesians 4.11, he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. He gave faithful men to the flock so they aren't like sheep having no shepherd who get devoured by the wolves in sheep's clothing. Matthew 9.37, Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. There are plenty of sheep. There needs to be more faithful stewards. So he says, Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Pray that some men will rise up who are laborers, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. 1 Timothy 5.17 But this has been Matthew chapter 9 about Dr. Jesus who has compassion for his motive and you can cancel your exorcist when he's around and your contacts become useless because he heals your eyesight. He's confident while operating. He cancels plagues. His, you know, call-ins aren't necessary. You can just come see him. He conquered the law. He's a comforting presence. Counsels every class. He confirmed the word with signs following. That was the m meaning of these miracles. He cleanses hearts. He clears your mind. Cures your sin. 